Hey everyone, before we get started, just two small bits of news. First, I'm going to be doing an updated live version of the Brahm episode at Caveat in New York City on December 2nd. If you're around, I hope you'll come and say, hey, it's going to be super rad. And Caveat is one of my favorite new places in the city. So I'll put a link in the show notes, um, or you can go to caveat.nyc. That's C-A-V-E-A-T dot NYC. And second... As you know, Reasonably Sound is a proud listener-supported podcast, and now, in addition to Patreon, you can support me in all my internet endeavors, including Reasonably Sound, on Drip, a new subscription-based creator support thingy by the folks at Kickstarter. I've posted a few things already, including a short essay on the McElroy brothers' use of the term boy. Link to that in the show notes, too, or you can head to d. R.I.P. forward slash Mike Rugnetta. Last time on Reasonably Sound, we talked about applause. We're going to talk about some of that episode in this one. So if you haven't listened to it, I would recommend it. But also, hey, who am I to tell you how to live your life? You do you. Here, we're going to talk about booing, which is, relatively speaking, a rare occurrence. I have maybe earnestly booed twice in my entire life, as long as we're not counting, like, at the Ren Fair when the Black Knight knocks the White Knight off of his horse in the jousting competition. You're supposed to boo that guy. That boo is just applause in a different form. And yes, I go to the Ren Fair sometimes, don't knock it till you tried it, it's great. In most other places, when upset with the result of some live, in-person event, a concert, a play, your friend Armand's poetry reading, one's impulse is to simply sulk, perhaps even while applauding. Dissatisfied with the proceedings, much has to be the case to inspire a lone boo, let alone an entire house full of boos. It just seems mean or impolite, which I mean, man, here we are again back at the norms about what's dignified. We're going to talk about how and why people boo and the few places like sports games where you are quote unquote allowed to do it. And then I'm going to encourage you to boo more. First things first, though, like we did with applause, let's talk about how we even got booing. This history is a little easier and quicker than applause since it's newer. The Athenian stranger, that big old platonic grump that we quoted at length last week, probably never heard a boo in his life. It was an invention of the 19th century. Before then, performers may have been heckled, hissed, whistled at, or jeered, but no boos. In a piece for Contemporary Theatre Review, Dan Rabiato explains how boo was first used to describe the sound a cow makes. After that, around the 16th century, it becomes a spoopy interjection. Boo! And from there, it starts being used to describe standing up to someone, challenging them in some way. You might say boo to them. And the reverse, to not say boo, would mean to utter not one word of disagreement. You may be familiar with this through the kindly euphemism, wouldn't say boo to a goose, used to describe someone who is so timid they wouldn't even assert themselves to a waterfowl. Honestly, though, I don't know if this holds up. I mean, have you ever met a goose? They are formidable. I am comfortable saying boo to all manner of things, but a goose may not be one of them. (coughs) Anyway, uh, it makes sense, then, how this word and sound eventually finds a new use in the 19th century to mean standing up to, challenging, or disagreeing with some performance, and perhaps putting a little fright into the performers, be they artists, athletes, or Hector from accounting. And maybe it's the literal generations of people having done it here and there when something didn't meet their expectations, but to my ears, a boo just sounds bad. It's not a good sound. A non-harmonic wash of applause made entirely out of individual hand claps with no readily apparent pitch, and which for the most part resemble one another, creates this even sound mass that's not unlike the patter of rain, but the boo, I mean, 
especially if you get a good group of people involved. It's not like someone's going to take out a pitch pipe to make sure the harmony is on point. The strain of the voice when projecting. See the Reasonably Sound episode on non-linear vocalization for more on that. The dissonant aggregate of individual calls. The fact that it's an ooh and not an ah or an e. It just, ugh, it's rough. Boo is one of those words that just, it sounds like what it means. That's called sound symbolism, by the way. Also, phono-semantics, apparently. And maybe some animalistic symbolism persists, too, in the idea that booing is uncultured or wild. Booing isn't often considered an earnest communication of how one feels, but rather reactive and judgmental. I mean, I get it. Booing isn't exactly constructive. The booing crowd isn't helpfully detailing the specific facets of some event which didn't meet their expectations. In one view, the booer says so little, they may as well be a mooing cow. Booing is not helpful, but simply boorish, rude, and often taken as an indication of ignorance. To look at this through the modernist lens we discussed last week, if applauding displays your appreciative prowess, does booing not, in contrast, suggest you're none too bright? That you just didn't get it? When you boo, are you maybe saying, boo, I didn't get it, boo, that went like right over my head, boo. I think of the stories told about the premiere of Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, a famous bout of boos often described as an outright riot. Though that is controversial. Link in the show notes with a bunch of other research links if you want them. We may now consider that audience a little dumb for not having realized that they were seeing the premiere of a world-changing piece of art, for witnessing what could be viewed as the birth of modernism itself. We are often invited to pity them for not recognizing what we see now as their enviable position. What a bunch of dimwits. This idea of boo as admission of intellectual deficiency is one reason people may rather just politely clap and then grouse about the performance over drinks later, quietly admitting... I don't know. Maybe it just wasn't for me. So be it a preference for politeness, a fear of being judged a dullard, or a little bit of both, most people abstain from monosyllabically vocalizing their displeasure. And it's just kind of been that way. It's one of those tautological things where, like, people don't boo more because people aren't booing. No one expects to want or have to do it, and so rarely are people ready and willing to boo at a booze notice. However, there are some places where booing is more of a norm. It's not normal, but it's more of a norm. We're going to talk about three of them. And after that, we're going to see if we can't add them all up into some sort of unified theory of booing that'll inform my recommendation that you do yourself some booze more often. The three places we're going to talk about are theater, sports, and everyone's favorite combination of the two, politics. <laughs> Collective response, agreeing how we're all going to react as an audience together, involves a lot of these calculations where we read the room, figure out what we think other people are going to do, see if we feel a little different from them, and if we do feel different, assess the social cost of expressing, perhaps all by our lonesome, an opinion that diverges from the norm. Most of the time, we deem the cost too high, and we politely abstain. But there are situations where the cost of dissent is low, or there's even value to be found in getting rowdy. To wit, let us ask, why might someone boo at the theater? Eric Nair in the Hudson Review offers epistemological panic as one potential reason. This is where, quote, people who are faced with something they don't understand react not with curiosity and a desire to learn more, but rather with fear and defensiveness. Nair, in his piece titled On the Booing of La Sonambula, 
is concerned with specific instances he's seen of stodgy arts patrons vocally disproving of unexpected castings, costume choices, and even set designs for otherwise familiar operas. He surmises that for these folks, there is a correct way to mount some show. And when the rules are not followed, the reaction is not, hmm, maybe these decisions are informed by aspects of the work I've yet to consider. But rather, this is wrong and bad, and you ruined it. Safe in the haven of tradition, this is a group of people who need not fear admitting they didn't get it, because in their view, it is the artists themselves who did not get it. Ha ha, I know you are, but what am I? My explanation for this would be something like, this is a way for people to conspicuously advertise their taste. Like applauding with gusto, the theater booer makes a statement about their values and distinguishes themselves within the audience group. But Nair takes another tact. He says the theater booer's epistemological panic belies an anti-intellectualism. Those intolerant of aesthetic advances balk at smart new ideas about old works, he says. This half echoes founding Italian futurist Filippo Marinetti, who also thought a booing audience was a sure sign of smart new work. In his essay, The Pleasures of Being Booed, he talks about how futurists showed contempt for their audiences. And if those audiences were booing, it meant that the futurist works were in fact innovating. Not everything booed is beautiful and new, Marinetti wrote, but everything immediately applauded is certainly no better than the average intelligence, and therefore is something mediocre, dull, regurgitated, or too well digested. And I mean, like, it's violent and weird, but I don't entirely disagree with either. Like, yes, please challenge your audience. And man, it is really a shame when people don't give new work a fair shake on its own terms, but contempt? Ugh. I don't think claiming people don't get it after a round of booing is an excuse to just write them off. In this view, which is very modernist, the booing audience is just wrong. And just as a brief digression, by simultaneously concluding that audiences violently reacting are wrong, and also that violent reactions indicate success, doesn't a contradiction arise? You can complain that an audience who boos doesn't get it, an attitude based in the idea that a work contains some meaning, and it's up to the audience to find that meaning there as it was intended. But it seems strange to then celebrate the boo as a sign that the audience did find what was in the work, something truly challenging. There's no room here for an audience whose response is, oh yeah, no, I got it. It was just bad. Anyway, if we can say that an audience is wrong about their reaction to a work of art, we might then ask, why invite them? Why even put works in public to begin with? If it's done before anyone has seen it, well then, hey, it's done. Why go to all the trouble of putting it somewhere? I mean, that is a, a costly and complicated process. Anyway, this attitude contradicts what I and probably most people think about the experience of culture that viewership by an audience is the final and necessary, if occasionally inconvenient, part of the art-making process. That there is no art without a spectator or their reaction. And even, perhaps, that is all that art is. Next up, the sports boo. At a game, people root for their team, and they wish very mean and nasty things upon not their team. Similar to the theater, sports fans have expectations, and when they're not met, players and officiants get an earful. In basketball, for instance, Donald L. Greer found that spectators most often boo after unjust calls against the home team. Next, most frequently booed are calls not made against the visiting team, followed finally by specific actions taken by visiting athletes. No games were observed, Greer writes, where sustained protest was directed at the home team. No one's going to boo their own boys, basically. Sporty boos aren't about fear of innovation as much as they're about that certain, as the French might say, 
I don't know what. That's unique to athletics. That communally felt thing that happens when an arena or a field or a stand of fans wants so badly their team to win. It's an expression of a group level emotion where you identify so strongly with a certain group that it becomes, psychologically at least, a part of yourself. Everything that's emotionally relevant to the group is then likewise emotionally relevant to you. Hello? Yes, this is fandom calling. In sports, the idea of a team pervades the whole experience. You have a team that you root for, and while you're not on the team, they are your team, and you are on the team's team with all the other fans of that team who often go to great lengths to experience games together. The significance of any particular game is often bound up in this intense collective ritual that can get pretty impassioned. Cut to basically a thousand TV ads where a dude wearing a jersey stands up suddenly from a couch and throws his hands into the air because of how much he loves the sport. Seriously, it's like chips, cars, furniture, rental, paper towels, and at least a couple prescription medicines at this point. Community is an explicit, permanent, and paramount facet of the experience of sport. Booze and cheers are one way to emotionally cash in on that experience's worth. Shouting at players or refs is participation in the communal drive towards victory, hopefully, and is a way to cement your allegiances. I am on that team. Woo! Or, in the case of a bad call, hey, I am on that team. Boo! Or even, that other team stinks. I'm not on that team. Also, boo. It's been shown more than once, by the way, that if you shout mean stuff at someone while they're trying to complete a task, they do a less good job. I know, surprise, surprise. And the reverse is also true for encouragement. It's been hypothesized by Greer and others that a major factor of home field advantage, besides familiarity with the surroundings, is the support provided by one's cheering hometown fans. They know that that applause is for them, and they know that the boos are for the other guys. There is actually, just a brief digression once more, a point of diminishing returns for this, though. Greer also found that when spectators boo a visiting team a lot, the home team can get overconfident and then start to play aggressively, racking up fouls and errors and penalties, so just, you know, take it easy, I guess. There's a fine line. So far from being passive spectators, crowds can impact the game. Sports fans may be audience, but they are very much a part of the action, even if they're not literally on the team. In an almost direct reversal of what Nair and Marinetti say about the arts, effusive participation is here far from an occasionally inconvenient byproduct. The presence of an audience and the strength of their response in all its forms is arguably an expression of the whole point unless you're into sports for the stats alone, in which case, I get it. Respect. This brings us, finally, to the political boo. You may be shocked to learn that in political speech, boos are not always so honestly what they seem. There are lots of different kinds here, so we're going to focus on boos made at people running for president or vice president. These are what Stephen Clayman studied in 1993 and what Peter Bull and Carolus Miskinis studied in 2015. Clayman was curious about how people decide to boo. Do they make decisions based on what they alone feel is the best thing to do? Or is there some, what he calls, mutual monitoring people judging if others are also like, yeah, yeah, boo this. Yeah, this thing is booable. Do it. What he found was during presidential and vice presidential debates, booing has to wind up, sometimes over a few seconds even. And in that span, the people who eventually revolt are involved in a kind of murmur or a buzz, as he called it. The reasoning for this that he arrived at is that People expect to applaud, but no one expects to boo. 
So when a booable sitch arises, people got to work up the nerve, ideally building consensus with those around them that, say, George H.W. Bush's jab at Bostonians was in poor taste. Or the people who cheered Dan Quayle's remarks about taxes are, in fact, nincompoops. Given this, Clayman assumes that booing is bad, that people don't want to do it and politicians don't want to hear it, but sometimes when the moment's right, someone or some ones are going to give the candidate a piece of their mind. This makes booing disaffiliative, Clayman says. Audience members boo to show which people or statements they are not affiliated with. In 2015, Bull and Miskinis say boo to this. A politician maybe says a thing that doesn't play and then they get razzed for it, sure. But there are at least two other kinds of boo they found. First, in the same way that there are applause lines where a politician says something they know the audience will love and they pause after they've said it to accommodate their fawning reaction, there are boo lines too. This is where a politician says something they know the audience will hate, and they pause after they've said it to accommodate their damning reaction. But this damning reaction shows support for the person speaking. It's not disaffiliative, but affiliative. For example, Bullimus Guinness point to a speech in 2012 during which Mitt Romney makes an ironic statement about Barack Obama after which the audience boos. So here, by booing Romney, they are, by proxy, booing Obama, which is a sign of support for the former. Bull and Miskinis say politicians may go searching for disaffiliative boos, too. Their example is Romney, again, who in Texas in 2012 arguably provoked a predominantly hostile audience into booing him, thereby seeking to enhance his standing not with the audience in the conference hall, but with an audience elsewhere namely that of hardline Republicans. In a sense, Romney appears rather like a stage villain in a pantomime, inviting the audience's disapproval. So just to review, if art may refuse the reactions of an audience, and sports may put those reactions to use without making them an explicit part of the action, in politics, audience reactions are designed for, which makes sense. We could argue about the existence of art or sports without spectators, but there is certainly no politics without constituents and their reactions, which will be considered, studied, gamed, and encouraged by politicians. Booing specifically, far from being an aberration, can be a sought-after result of political speech, giving citizens an outlet for their anger in ways which, affiliative or not, can aid a candidate in their standing. After a little break, we're going to smoosh all this together. We're going to try to construct some sort of booing theory Voltron. And then I'm going to make my case that we should be booing more. In the grand portrait of booing, absent a close look at particular settings and norms, we're often invited to pity those booed, and are given permission to judge, and also pity, those who were not patient, kind, or tolerant enough to stifle their cow sounds. It's often thought that booers have taken the easy way out. Instead of doing something, they sit pretty and they complain, ignorant of the real work it takes to even have the opportunity to be booed. They're imagined as reveling in their easily acquired hater prestige, and like those Sonambula or Rite of Spring audiences, as maybe even being a little dumb. In reality, I think booers are frequently doing the one thing they feel they can do in a situation where they feel ancillary at best, or powerless at worst. We are invited to judge and pity them, but maybe we should aspire to facets of their honesty and daring. Really, I'm interested in what it means to develop a more sophisticated understanding of how and when a community of audience members can rightly express its disappointment at public events. 
In last week's episode, we talked about Bettina Brandel Reese and her idea that applause functions in collectives and produces collectives. That just as much as it's groups of people who applaud, applause itself can also create groups of people. This is true, I think, for booing as well. As much, if not more so. Drawing from our theater, sports, politics, triumvirate, here's why I think booing is important and why we should be doing it more. There are four points. First, a solidly arrived at boo feels earnest. Being that it transgresses norms of spectatorship and is a relatively rare occurrence even in places where it is condoned, when a critical mass of people boo, it feels like they mean it. They may not be right or good or kind, but where applause is given lightly, even freely, a boo is given stingily. And so it stands to reason a round of boos represents the audience at its most honest. Second, a booing audience is an engaged audience. A round of boos is a sign that the audience has noticed something. A booing audience announces what Dan Rabiato calls a fault line in the spectacle they witness, a deeply subterranean defect capable of causing great instability, whereas an applauding audience announces approval of their own presence, if we accept last week's conclusion. Third, a round of boos elevates the audience in stature to that of the spectacle they witness. Rabiato also writes that in booing, an audience reflects theater back to itself. We're going to expand on that and we're going to say they reflect any spectacle back to itself. Theater, art, politics, work, sports, education, whatever. In booing, an audience announces themselves as ongoing? I'm not really sure what the word is. They're not something that materializes at the conclusion to then approve. The spectacle and the audience simultaneously create and need one another. And finally, a boo is often the only voice an audience has. Applause is so de rigueur that, except in its most dramatic instances, it's rendered nearly silent. But a round of booing is likely to precipitate a moment in which the audience is actually heard. To be clear, I don't think we should be marching into performances and concerts, novel readings and work meetings, and whenever we're a little upset, start crowing. But I think where our applause muscle is maybe overdeveloped, our booing muscle has atrophied. It needs exercise. And I think it has a potential to do some heavy lifting. After one final act break, a short case study in two related boos that occurred almost exactly a year ago, and a few words on the example they set. In July of 2016, in the midst of the presidential election, President Barack Obama at the Democratic National Convention said this. And then there's Donald Trump. <laughs> Don't boo, vote. Extra points if you can tell me what sort of political boo that was. This wasn't the first time Obama had uttered this little quip. He used it in 2012 and a few times throughout his presidency when constituents wanted to voice their displeasure at some politician, policy, etc. Don't boo, vote. To which I ask, like the young girl who is confused about her choice of El Paso taco shells, why can't we have both? Obama implies here that booing is useless and voting is useful. Store your booing energy and use it to vote. But the sad truth is that more people may be able to boo than vote. Record levels of voter disenfranchisement and wildly gerrymandered districts in the United States, among plenty of other much more conspiratorial sounding developments, have meant that voting is not by any means the most convenient, impactful, or truest expression 
of every citizen's political will. And so we are left to find additional ways that we can earnestly communicate the fault lines we see in the spectacle of politics. We are left to find additional ways to show how, as constituents, we and our civic institutions mutually constitute one another. Look, it's right there in the name. We are left to find additional ways to show our affiliations in such a way that we're not playing into the design process of political rhetoric, to make it clear that they are playing our game, not we theirs. There was, last year, I think, one round of booze which did some of this. It was when Mike Pence was booed at Hamilton. I am not thrown away my shot. After this incident, like clockwork, we were invited to pity Mike Pence, who just wanted to see a show. And we were invited to judge the House, who showed him no respect. This is wrongheaded. This is the invasion of an already misguided set of modernist norms of spectatorship infecting capital P politics, where we are anything but spectators. We are and should always be active participants, and not only during business hours. I cannot live a moment free from civic entanglement. Believe me, if I could, I would. Neither can you, and neither can the vice president. That Pence got given the business in the theater, of all places, also feels especially meaningful. The Athenian stranger was afraid that crowds of like-minded people who found themselves in agreement over the arts might find agreement over much more, including politics, and in their brazen shamelessness, topple the aristocrats. What's more, the theater feels an appropriate context for our contemporary brand of politics. One can boo at the theater, but I might wager whatever anyone boos is theater. We're closing in on an end here, so I won't belabor the point of what is and is not theater. That's a topic many people much smarter than me have spent much more than a paragraph on, but I hope it suffices to say that theater is not just some empty art form which exists in its purest form on stages in New York or London. Theater is not simply some exercise in make-believe which sustains the aesthetic diet of the cultural elite or artistically adventurous. The theater is a building, but theater is an arena of very real, occasionally treacherous, and most importantly, dramatic action. There are theaters of play in which one might see stories about war or politics, but there are also actual theaters of war and political theater that may make good stories but decidedly lack the same sense of play. If applause acknowledges the perhaps but not certainly celebratory receipt of some spectacle, boos indicate that that thing is worthy of thought, worthy of a critical orientation, has stakes, and is perhaps most simply dramatic, dramatically different, dramatically unexpected, dramatically threatening. A booing audience cannot celebrate its virtuosity in having chosen correctly. They can't appreciate their own appreciation, as that appreciation does not exist. So, working against a sense of propriety, they have, often in surprise, found agreement in disagreement with the spectacle at hand. And where a reasoned back and forth is impossible or has proven ineffective, we are left to stand up to someone, to challenge them, to say boo. My name is Mike Rignetta. And this podcast has been Reasonably Sound. Reasonably Sound is a proud listener-supported podcast. Thanks so much to every current patron and supporter of the show. It literally would not be possible without you. If you like the show and you want to help out, you can give a per-episode donation on Patreon at patreon.com forward slash reasonably sound. As a patron, you would get access to the newsletter, the Reasonably Sound Slack, and more. 
You can also help me in all of my internet endeavors, including but not limited to Reasonably Sound, with a monthly donation on Drip at d.rip forward slash Mike Rignetta. My Drip account is still in its founding period as of posting this, so if you want to get in on the ground floor, now's the time. You can find Reasonably Sound on Twitter and Instagram at Reasonably SND, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Mike Rignetta. Reasonably Sound's theme and act break music are by Will Stratton, and its visual design is by Tita Tepp. <laughs>